Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Susan. I will try in this uh, 50, 55 minutes discuss with you the process of decision making of immediate loading. During the lecture, we'll have a short literature review. We'll discuss the effects of long-term OSIS integration as, this, as described in the initial paper by Albert Zanadel in 81. I will develop with you a algorithm that we follow in the decision making to load, not to load, what do we do preoperatively, what do we do postoperatively. We'll definitely have to go through some surgical design changes, in my opinion, to get increased percentage and uh, increased success rate. Hopefully, we'll cover some indication, certainly contraindications, and come to some kind of conclusions. When one evaluates the process of immediate loading, up to January 2008, there are approximately 108 scientific publications. They vary in their merit, and the loading period is 0 to 12 weeks. They include placement and loading for a single tooth, loading of a partially edentulous segment, a full arch, as well as implant supported over denture. If you follow the definition of the glossary of maxillofacial implant cutest in 2007, immediate loading is defined as loading within 48 hours. Taking this definition into account, as of again January 08, there are only 58 papers testing this parameter. If you broadly look at the data, it is more or less suggested that your highest success rate will be in single, in splinted units, in sites with optimal bone density. The highest risks, however, relates usually to the posterior maxilla, associated with poor bone quality, short implants, long superstructure, and excessive force. There are many advantages, and it's very attractive to try to go through the protocol of immediate loading, because certainly it will eliminate partial or complete edentialism. You'll have less restoration, less provisional restoration. And the patient's visit to your office will be reduced. It will certainly reduce your treatment time for you and the patient, and it will reduce the cost. If you, however, go slightly deeper into the literature, you find that every, almost every factor that is discussed as a cause for success or a cause for failure is being contradicted. For example, <clears throat> let's look at bone density. There are some who suggest that bone density has some kind of a bearing on success or failure and you'll be more successful in a type 1 and 2 bone. Others will show it as an insignificant factor. How about force? Papers, force and bruxicism. Papers by Leckholm and others suggest that, well, parafunctional activities and excessive force will cause failure in immediate loading. Other papers by Ibanez show the opposite. How about smoking? Some suggest a cause for failures. Others don't see it as a cause at all. How about success and failure when one compares immediate loading versus a delay loading? Well, reports vary from 70% success to 100% success. That means that if you have a segment and you need to have three implants, you may have to place four and a half to be successful if you follow that parameter. There's only one parameter in common for all those 58 papers, and that is the all equate implant survival as successful immediate loaded implants. There's only one paper, only one, but Nolkin, who measures other parameters. And since I'm here to present you some of the literature and some of my own clinical experience, I would say that this type of immediate loading and this type of result is a disaster. Yes, the implant survived, 
but they result in this type of a patient with <coughs> severe ridge defect, or in this type of a patient where <coughs> complete ridge loss and pretty compromised intraoperative aesthetic, intraoral aesthetic, <coughs> extraoral aesthetic is achieved. This is not a successful reconstruction, and it's not a successful immediate loading procedure, in my opinion. So, to make it very clear in advance, everything that is my bias will be in yellow or orange. So, that means that we have to come up with a new definition, a broader definition, what is success and what is failure. And that means that survival itself is only one parameter. Point one in the definition. All the member implant and the surrounding tissue should be in a state of physiological and aesthetic state. Point two, which is a very, very important factor for the, those of you who <coughs> restore then those immediately loaded implants, and I'm sure that my, and the Dennis Tanner will follow up on that as well. The restoration, including the hardware components, should be stable over long term. And three, which is equally important, that the surrounding tissue presents itself without any excessive or progressive loss of soft tissue or bone as compared to delay procedures. Now we all have our patients that will, <coughs> will come in and will consider immediate loading. You'll play, you'll have a good feel about the situation, you'll follow the normal examination, you'll place the implants, you'll place a provisional restoration, and your final result <coughs> will be both functional and aesthetic of a long period of time, like in this position of <coughs> number four and number 13. The same will apply in a patient such as here, lower left, multiple implant place. I like to place an implant per tooth. Once you are in an optimal position, even in a resorbed mandible, even though you can define it as a type three probably, the implant can be placed in optimal position, which is critical, and we'll cover that later, and then they can be loaded immediately. This type of a clinical situation is different than this one. What makes me decide that in this patient, I will use some provisional implants, I will load some implants, but not load others, and decide to go through a delay protocol for some implants, an immediate <coughs> protocol for the other, with <coughs> the precision of surgical execution, <coughs> placing the provisional implants in a position that will not compromise the final placement and the final reconstruction, and five years later, you get <coughs> the successful prosthetic reconstruction with long-term osseous integration. What makes us decide to go with one protocol or the other protocol? It's important that we all realize that we're dealing with two different stabilities. The initial stability, which is mechanical, which depends only on your ability surgically to sit the implant in a tight osteotomy, therefore ensuring that the implant will have maximum mechanical anchorage within the bone. Given sufficient time, provided this mechanical stability has been achieved, it will progress to a secondary or biological, <coughs> biological anchorage in which the bone will populate the area and form a direct contact between implant and bone. In order to illustrate to you the total poss clinical possibilities that are available, that can happen when the patient comes to your office, I created the following three simulations. In this type of a situation, the site is completely healthy. You have a healed site, the bone healed, soft tissue healed. You create the osteotomy. Macroscopically, we like to reach a minimum of 40 Newton centimeters, usually measured by the electrical motor, and the implant macroscopically will be completely stable within the site. So we get mechanical stability. The challenge for this implant is that microscopically, of course, we have large gaps. 
The question for you clinically are simple. Can this implant undergo occlusal forces or any other loading forces and during the same time have bone deposited in those areas, complete and followed up by bone deposited along the full length of the implant body and mature and get your secondary biological stability and survive that over long term. Theoretically, in a hill site, there is enough data to suggest that accurate osteotomy, mechanical anchorage will be followed by bone deposition and optimal healing. So this is the linear line of progression, initial stability to secondary stability. In an interesting initial paper <clears throat> by Schnittmann and Worley, followed by Sanabi and Malo, followed by other many, many publications, this appears to happen, provided the implant load does, is not exceeding a certain threshold. What's a threshold has never been described, has never been measured, not for different patients and not for different sites. How much is it? We do not know, but we know that provided that we follow this protocol, that will happen. A second clinical situation, which covers another gamut of the patient and the sites that you see, is this type of a situation in which the clinical, the site is being reduced, the amount of bone is reduced. It's equivalent to areas of large extraction socket where you still have some bony housing, but a lot of bone housing is missing. Osteotomy is being prepared. You try to be very tight. You try to get maximum anchorage. The implant is being placed. Here, of course, the gaps and the spaces and the missing bone will play a role, a logical role in possible healing. And the question for us is whether this type of an implant will undergo the maturation, achieving biological stability, and achieving long-term stability. Question mark. It takes much more to be successful in this type of clinical situations. So can we get from this position to maturation of bone, and can we progress from the initial phase, which is mechanical, to the biological? Going with this approach, I would remind you a comment in a publication by Pierre Scherer that suggests that certainly when implants are not disturbed or not loaded, maturation will occur. Of course, the risk in this type of approach is that the implants are being disturbed by occlusal forces and healing may be jeopardized. This is a very different situation in this, than this type of a clinical patient or site that is presented to you. Here, most of the alveolar housing is missing. In this type of a patient, to try to create an osteotomy as tight as possible and try to get mechanical stability is possible. But it needs a large reconstructive procedures. And I do not mean one or two millimeter that buccal bone is missing and then publishes reconstruction. But assuming a site that is practically completely missing and the implant itself actually would be stable, not in its native alveolar site, but it would be stable because of your grafting procedures. Well, can we, in this type of patients, achieve the mechanical stability and bone maturation. This, ladies and gentlemen, does not happen in normal orthopedic procedures. In a femur replacement, where the implant is six and a half to 10 inches in length, three quarter to one and a half millimeter uh, centimeters in diameter, in 100% of successful implants, you'll have fibrous capsule. And in 60% of the cases, you'll have some fibrous capsule. So does it work? Well, let's revisit this amazing paper, in my opinion, of 
Albertson, Branemark, Hansen, and Lindstrom of 1981. After all, immediate loading is a very short period. We have to look at long-term loading and compare those parameters. To remind you, in, these papers, in this paper, they had six factors that may or may not play a role in immediate loading. Implant material was one. Implant design of what is called today macrostructure. Implant finish, which is called microstructure. The status of bone, according to them, played a critical role. Surgical technique, that in my opinion, and we'll come back to it, is the most important parameter and implant loading condition. How many of those factors really play a role, a significant role in success or failure of immediate loading procedures? An interesting observation by Nakanti and Fenner is that as of 2006, we do not have any optimal parameters or guidelines for inclusion or exclusion of patients to undergo immediate loading procedures. <clears throat> in, a work, in work that I did with Richard Sullivan, who is a unique clinician, we tried to develop an algorithm that will help you decide load, delay load, don't load. Well, the purpose of a medical algorithm is basically to give you a standard way to decide and therefore a standard way to deliver a medical procedure or a surgical procedure. Well, to explain to you in a very simple way how does it work, let's take a lamp that doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work, your first question, your first logical question would be, well, is the lamp plugged in? Well, if it's not plugged in, you, <coughs> you plug it in. The lamp still doesn't work. Your second logical question would be, is the bulb burned out? Well, if it is burned out, you place a new bulb. And if the lamp still doesn't work, you buy a new lamp. Well, this is one variable. We created here 13 parameters. I will go one by one in each of them. And you'll have a scorecard of zero or one for each possible factor affecting immediate loading, in our opinion. I would say in advance that all those, all those factors are not equal in helping you. So even though each of them may get zero or one, some of them be more significant or less significant for a site or a patient. The combination of some of these factors are sometimes more critical. Now let's go and the first four which are more straightforward. The first one is the site status. We define it as healed or simultaneous extraction. Despite papers by Glauser that show that you have greater success rate in, of immediate loading in a immediate extraction site, it is clear that in immediate extraction site you're deficient both in bone and in soft tissue. Certainly the contact bone to implants is being reduced, and in our opinion, it's therefore a risk factor. Other risk factors in a site will include previous infections, will include multiple surgical procedures, such as multiple periapical surgery. All those will make the site one or give it a score of zero. How about musculature? You see a patient with very prominent mastitis, medial pterygoid, and temporalis. For us, there are high risk factors. Those with flaccid muscles will get a score of zero. How about parafunction? For us, the presence of parafunction will get a score of one. Lack of parafunction will get a score of zero. And opposing jaw. Certainly, the amount of force that can be delivered by ceramometal reconstruction or natural dentition opposite an immediately loaded implant is much greater than a patient who just has an opposing edential space or a partial or full denture. Yes, clinically you can certainly modify the amount of force, reducing the cantilever, reducing the occlusal table, eliminate eccentric eccentric contact, allowing only centric contact. All those things are obviously variables 
for declination. But as a general rule, the opposing jaw we measure. Is it opposed by natural teeth or ceramometal reconstruction? The score will be one. And how about bone density? Yes, in some papers, such as Bergfist, bone density does not, is suggested not to play a role. However, in other papers by Glauser et al., obviously placement in a type 1 and 2 bone was safer for immediate loading than in a compromised bone. And certainly in a maxilla that I would define as type 1, your ability to achieve mechanical anchorage is very, very high, as opposed to a maxilla that is extremely resorbed with highly compromised molars with large cancellous spaces and almost fatty degeneration of the marrow, your ability to get this mechanical, which gets to 35 Newton centimeters per molar, we work at 40 with my partner, Dr. Gordon, this kind of a situation will be much more difficult to get the initial mechanical stability. And how about bone vitality? It is discussed plenty in the orthopedic literature, very little in our literature. What I mean by bone vitality is you instrument, you injure the bone, you get a bleeding surface. The bleeding surface is not just a marking that, yes, it's bleeding, but it represents the ability of the bone to respond to this initial trauma, respond favorably, and then create your quick biological contact and allow the implant to withstand those forces. Now, vitality of the site has no correlation to type 1 or type 5 bone or type 4 bone. I call it 5 because there's no, cancer, no cortical bone at all. You may have cortical bone, and we see that often in cranial bone graft, we see that in our uh, cortical cancellous graft from the hip graft, that as you instrument them, there is no vitality or minimal vitality, such as here. <clears throat> we'll take a cranial graft, or we'll take a iliac crest graft or veneer graft, and at six months on a cranial graft, you can see that this site, yes, there is no resorption, but very, very little vitality. And if you try to instrument this type of a patient and immediate load, in our opinion, in a site with reduced vitality, you're taking a major risk. And how about reach height? It is reported, and I agree with Al's observation, that in a ridge that is shorter than 10 millimeter, such as the posterior maxilla here that is undergoing hip graft, and undergoing sinus graft and a J graft, this type of a short ridge is highly risky for immediate loading. Similarly, in a mandible, a shortly resorbed bridge is risky for immediate loading, as opposed to a very long maxillary ridge where immediate loading is reported to be more successful. And how about ridge cross-section? What we mean by here is not only facial lingual dimension, but we also mean does the ridge have concavities facially, lingually, or both? A typical example is in the area of 23 to 26 where you have two where you have a very narrow facial lingual ridge with two existing plates, and many of you may decide to graft it before in any, even attempting it, and some of you may even decide that they are not implant sites. I think surgically, primary mechanical stability can be achieved, but this is obviously a situation that is risky for immediate loading procedure. Similarly, in the anterior maxilla, with a very prominent <clears throat> subnasal concavity with a very narrow ridge. Again, the cross section of the ridge is not favorable for this type of procedures. Or in an areas of immediate extraction between 5 to 12, where the buccal bone is completely undermined or absent on 89, there is very little cancerous component, and the cross section of this type of ridge, again, is not favorable for this type of procedures. And how about splinted unit versus non-splinted? It has been often reported that a splinted unit will act much more favorably for placement and loading. Now, 
despite the fact that this case turned successfully, this is a way how not to do so. Well, the surgeon decided that number 13 will be replaced with an implant, and since the implant is very short, he loaded with a provisional restoration, was absolutely successful, but then on a <coughs> during the loading phase, con <coughs> connected it to a periodontal involve number 15 and number 13, and despite the fact that this turned to be successful, this is absolutely contraindicated splinting. Similarly, in this type of a situation, which a sinus graft is to be performed locally for 14 and 15, I mean for 15, and the implant is then joined during the healing phase to two periodontal involved, 14 and 16, this is also a way how not to do so. Splinting two remaining teeth during the healing phase, in our opinion, is risky, will score one on the chart, and is contraindicated. Splinting, however, can be performed between teeth and between roots for the purpose of immediate loading, such as in this case, where tooth number 14 will be replaced, provided that you're accurate in your surgical design and you are going to perform precisely surgically, you can get the optimal aesthetic and functional result within splinting within a tooth or within multiple units. So this is a splinting that will help you to be successful. And how about soft tissue envelope? When we discuss the soft tissue, I don't only <coughs> suggest to limit yourself, gingiva or not, certainly the biotype is only one factor. Please look at symmetry, look at efficiency, <coughs> look what is missing, look at the degree of destruction, and can you then achieve the definition of success that I presented to you about 15 minutes ago? In my opinion, in this type of clinical situation, we have absolutely unfavorable soft tissue in anterior maxilla or this beautiful immediate success. These procedures are absolutely contraindicated and we score the score one because there is no way that you can place, load, and reconstruct this type of a defect and get the patient what they have lost. And how about the adjacent bone level that has been described? in many of uh, the publications regarding delay loading and regarding aesthetic reconstruction. Unfavorable bone, adjacent bone, does not relate only to teeth and does not relate only to adjacent implant. Relates also in the edentulous area, and here we have a situation that the remaining implants underwent bone loss, the remaining sockets with severe bone loss, <coughs> some of the dental units, are uh, in bone level that extremely unfavorable. The facial bone may be completely missing. The position of the crest of the bone that will support your future papillaries is unfavorable. And this is again, will score one and will be a risky endeavor for any procedure of immediate loading. And now about collateral damage. And this is my favorite of the 13. Maybe the next one is more favorite. And that is something, please avoid any collateral damage, which can happen because of anatomical structure, but can happen more commonly because of surgical techniques. This young lady presented with congenitally missing teeth number 24, 25. And of course, when there's a space, there are implants. And when the implants, now we rush and place and load. Seven, eight surgery, surgical procedure later, the one implant is lost. The second implant is coming up with a sequestra of the bone that now is trying to be stabilized by intraosseous splinting. The bone is completely lost on teeth number 23 and 25. 23 and 25 are non vital at that stage. And this poor young lady, they just came with two missing 24 25 with optimal ridge leaves our offices nine procedures later with missing four teeth with a large ridge defect. When you have any doubt of collateral damage, do not proceed. Another example, 
When you look at this type of a CAT scan, you will say, wow, that's a great possibility for immediate placement. The bone is dense. I will tell you in advance that the opposing jaw is supported by a denture. You have here 13 to 15, millim 15 millimeter of mandible to work with. But the vitality of the site is very poor. Remember the vitality, the ability of the site to respond. Implant is placed, opposing a denture, fracture of the jaw, sequestra, chronic sequestra in that area, fracture of, this, of the jaw in submental area, try correct it. Now these kind of patients, ladies and gentlemen, are coming to us for elective procedures. I may want to make it very clear, the whole parameters, the whole algorithm, all those patients are capable and medically correct to undergo, or medically fit, to undergo implant placement, which is an elective procedure. This becomes now a non-elective procedure. Or how about anatomical structures? A prominent incisive canal, presence of a large veneer graft, prominence of a sinus with a short alveolus. All those areas are risky, and we call it risk of a collateral damage, and therefore we'll score one on our table. Another example, blades are being removed, large prominent mental nerve and a large infalveolar nerve. Please do not attempt immediate loading in presence of those prominent and vital structures. And again, the mental nerve position here. And how about simultaneous reconstruction? And I here again don't mean if you're missing two millimeter of a buckle plate or lingual plate, this is not a large reconstruction in our opinion. In those patients in presence of a large reconstruction, the score will be one, absence will be zero. A typical example is a three-dimensional reconstruction, the posterior maxilla, with a very prominent sinus, a veneer graft and sinus graft is being performed. Well, you can see clearly that those implants are mainly placed, some in the maxilla, but the remaining are in a donor bone. When you look at it six months later, subsequent to healing, yes, those little seams and cuts have healed. But to load these patients with the immediate loading protocol becomes very, very risky. Similarly, in this type of patient, where 18 millimeter of vertical maxilla is being reconstructed, supported by a mesh with a cortical cancellous graft. Most of your implants will be then in the reconstructed bone and the risk of failure are very high. And I fell into this trap in a large J graft and then connected tissue taken from the buttock to augment the tissue. The J graft has been placed, the implants have been placed, they were stable. I reached mechanical loading, but upon uncovering, of course, the amount of resorption that you'll get on this J-graph is not always um, predictable, with the result of substantial amount of almost total length of the implant exposed at six and seven position. So when we look at this algorithm again, and we look at the progression factor, you may score zero, and you may score up to 13. It is not just the number but it's a combination of those type of factors. One thing is clear, that if your score is 13 and your surgical patient is planned for Friday the 13th, it is not indicated. It's also not indicated when it's planned for Thursday the 12th. On the other hand, I do not want to give you the impression that if your score is two, you're safe. Let's assume, and I mentioned it's a combination of the factors, let's assume that you're reconstructing and trying to immediate load seven and eight. And your score two comes from simultaneous reconstruction and collateral damage. These two, ladies and gentlemen, for me is 100% failure, 100% risk, but it's only two. When will I feel safer? Well. Certainly, if you have a normal site and you have a wide enough ridge and you have dense bone 
and you have little force and you have adequate soft tissue, you are in a much safer zone. As you progress to the red zone, where well, you have large defect, previous infection, poor bone, large reconstruction, these are high risk and not worth it. Let's look at, after all, immediate loading is for a short period. How does it hold over long term? And how does it relate to the parameters of immediate loading described initially by Albertson? Well, the first three parameters that he discussed, implant material, implant design, and implant finish, has no bearing whatsoever on this mechanical stability. However, when you take the fourth factor, which is status of bone, it of course affects the site status, bone density, relates to the vitality of the site, relates to ridge bone height and ridge cross section. It does relate to soft tissue envelope and obviously relates to the adjacent bone level. How about surgical technique? And although they de <coughs> define the surgical technique as a traumatic technique in bone and minimal damage, of course, we expanded it, it's years later, to risk of collateral damage and surgical reconstruction. Surgical technique with immediate loading and oral surgery has not been, inv in, has not been invented here. It has been already discussed in the 17th century by a very well-known European surgeon that the parameters for surgical success depend upon gentle manipulation, free tension, free tension, minimal dead space, and the most important maintenance of vascularity. And when you look at implant loading condition, this is the last parameter Bry um, discussed in this paper. This certainly affect, is affected by our algorithm of musculature, parafunction, the opposing jaw, and whether the units are splinted or single. Um, how about the implant cutting edge or macrostructure? In general, you can divide generically implants into two categories. The one will be the taper one and the other one will be the self-tapping one. And each of you will have their own favorite or multiple favorites. The implant that is a taper design often does not have a cutting edge. So it will work extremely well in a type three and four bone because as it is inserted, the bone will be, con <coughs> will be pushed laterally and it basically will act like an osteotome. It will have a problem when you operate with this type of an implant in a type one and two bone because if your osteotomy is too wide, it will be unstable. And if your osteotomy is too narrow, you will not be able to sit the neck of the implant in the right position relative to the bony crest. The other types of the implants are the self-tapping one and they have a self-tapping capacity. The self-tapping capacity relates to the cutout at the apical part of the implants and the vertical sharp edges and its length. So obviously the longer the cutout, the sharper the edges, the more capable of cutting through bone for this design. So while it will work very well in a type one or two bone, it may be extremely problematic in soft bone because it will cut through the bone. You will not get primary stability. And the only way that you can get it is go, ap go apically to you, your destination where you may have some structure that you may not want to hit. Now, it is not to say that you cannot use one design, one implant for all bone, but then you have to change your protocol. So, the same way, that you decide on a site for a site. You decide the diameter of the implant. You decide the length of the implant. You should also decide with regards to macrostructure or the self-tapping capacity of the implant. So you may go in one area and go with an implant that has a very sharp cutting edge and go and operate another site with a less sharp cutting edge. That means that in a compromised bone, in my opinion, the most important step of reconstruction or getting primary stability for immediate loading 
will be to get minimal width and even under preparation of the length. So what are my absolute contraindications for immediate loading? If your implant stability is not achieved and it's completely dependent on reconstructed bone, absolutely contraindicated. If you patient or the site will have to undergo extensive aesthetic, I mean soft tissue reconstruction, contraindicated. If you have risk or you develop risk because you have surgical procedure or surgical design for adjacent structures, contraindicated. If you lack primary stability, and in a paper by Malloy, it measured to 35 Newton centimeters, as I mentioned to you, we go to 40 Newton centimeters, contraindicated, don't leave it there. And misplaced implants. Now, misplaced implants will not only cause a problem for you later with a restorative plan and aesthetic plan, but a misplaced implant, let's assume that you want to reconstruct the posterior maxilla and you're planning to support the load with immediate loading with three implants and one of them is misplaced. That means that you'll only have two implants to support the load and if three implants were optimal to support the load and now you have two, please abort this endeavor. What are the relative contraindications that I can suggest? The one, if insertion is different than your plan, there is nothing wrong to consent the patient for possible immediate loading, have alternative immediate restorative options such as provisional restoration and adjacent teeth, a removable that is supported, and say, well, I deviated, I'm in the wrong place, I'm going to go for delay loading or redo the whole procedure. As mentioned before, 40 Newton for us is the minimum of your mechanical anchorage and the implant geometry. If you're going to place a wide body implant in a narrow ridge, if you're going to use a straight wall implant in a ridge that has buccolingual concavity, you're running a risk of undermining the buccolingual bone and creating a problem. It is my opinion that surgical stability depends on, I mean, primary stability or mechanical stability depends upon surgical skills, number one. It's always the main factor. To a lesser degree, it will depend on your bone density and to the least on the macro design or macro specification of the implant. I would also suggest to you with the rush for immediate loading that we should pay much, much more attention to extra oral changes. Yes, it is true that once immediate loading is performed, we may take a patient that is 50 years old and has 20 years denture experience and convert them within days or sometimes hours to a full bridge. But those patients, all changes actually make them look even older. So while we're rushing to give the patient a function, please ask yourself what will they look like intraorally and extraorally. And it's often unfavorable. And I've yet to see a patient that comes to the office at age 40, would love to leave the office with a bridge and look age 60. That doesn't happen. That means that immediate loading without attention, especially in a fully edentulous patient, without paying attention to extra oral facial appearance, it's at best maintaining the status quo. At worst, it makes it worse. Some conclusions and clinical suggestions. I believe that different patients and different sites should be treated absolutely individually when you contemplate immediate loading. So it is possible the tooth number four will be immediate loaded and tooth number six may not. Whenever delay loading will achieve a greater success, remember our definition, it should be a treatment of choice. It is my belief that surgical skills and optimal decision making is the most critical aspect of immediate loading, especially 
in compromised site and in the aesthetic zone. And if we don't follow this protocol, yes, we may have a successful implant that is not moving, and yes, it integrated, and we may have a disaster with <coughs> subsequent to implant placement and immediate loading. Interestingly, in a paper by Komiyama in 2008, her conclusions were that today, many treatment concepts and new implants are launched without substantial long-term clinical testing. I would remind you, ladies and gentlemen, there are only two parameters. There's the host bed, and there's the implant. The host bed, in my opinion, requires much more modification. It's much more complicated, much more difficult, and it does necessitate a very precise critical review. The implant modification, some of it is supported by scientific data, and others is well supported by marketing skills. I would suggest, I suggested to you in the last 50 minutes or so, my thinking process regarding immediate loading. Some of it is supported by the literature. Some of it may be proven right and wrong in the future by future studies. I think that as a profession, and this academy has a major responsibility. We have the responsibility to the members, so when you go back to your office on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, you don't fall into the holes that should have been charted already and are obvious that when you try a procedure like immediate loading, you're going to go wrong. On the other hand, we have a responsibility to our patients because we are there to act as a safety net and protect them. And protecting them means informing them what is true and what is not and demanding from the manufacturers much more data much more precise studies, much more defined studies, and much long-term studies, so that the delivery of our special, our, this type of a procedure of immediate loading will be much more successful and much more predictable. For this, I believe us and the patients will be much better off. I thank you very much. Program continues on part two.